I've been asked to tell a story again, and I was racking my brain, which story to tell you? I think I'm going to tell you the story about a television network in Guatemala. Just to show you how, how the rules of the game work. They illustrate it. Now, years ago, we bought a television network in Bolivia for $1.5 million. You will read the details in the book Mission Miracles, or you've heard it maybe already on the internet. I told the Lord, they were asking for one million, and now they're asking for 1.5 million. What am I to do? And, and the Holy Spirit whispered in my ear, one million, 1 1.5, what's the difference? You don't have anything. <laughs> so if I'm going to pay for it anyway, I don't care. The most important thing is seize the opportunity. So I signed my name on the dotted line for 1.5 million. And... And as it turned out, um, we had to wait 18 months. It was a very big trial. We made a down payment of 100,000. We borrowed the money from the bank. Shortly after, a check came in for 100,000. We'd never received a $100,000 check. It was a miracle. We knew God was leading. We got on the air. We began broadcasting across the country. And even though we waited 18 months, God paid for the whole entire thing with one donation, 1.5 million, cash. I knew God had it. I don't know why he made me wait for 18 months. I think he was trying to prove a point, not only to teach me to hang on and have faith no matter what, because we're going to have to have a faith that is able to tolerate hunger and delay. So we have to learn to trust even if there's delays. But I think he was also testing most of the wealthy Adventists. Because I had four friends that were multi, multi millionaires, and two of them were billionaires. They could have paid it just like that. But they decided to draw a circle around me and make sure that nobody would pay for it. David, you just can't go around moving forward without money. What they were telling me is if you don't get our permission, don't do things like that. And I said, but God has always rewarded moves of faith. Yes, but this is big money. You are moving on little airplanes. This time we're talking about 1.5 million, and be, you cannot do those kind of things by just going forward by faith. And I thought to myself, what's the difference to God? $50,000, 1.5 million, same thing, right? To God, money's not worth anything. It's just a piece of paper. Well, anyway, they drew a circle around me and tried to make sure that nobody would donate to teach me a lesson, and I think in the end I did learn a lesson. God taught me that he's faithful and he will, he will follow, fulfill his word, no matter what, because it's a promise. So I learned that. But then God asked me to go to other places and do the same thing, and I didn't want to. Because I said, Lord, why should I suffer again? You're just going to make me wait and it's going to be painful again. Sound like Jeremiah complaining. <clears throat> but I eventually got my courage up again, and I said, if the Lord opens the door and he gives us opportunity, it means that he's going to fulfill his word. And there's too, million, too many millions of souls at stake. If I don't go, I don't know of another guy who's doing it. So I said, Lord, I'm sorry. If you make me wait, I will wait. And if you want me to have an opportunity, but you're going to have to prove to me that those opportunities are going to remain. So. I found out there was an opportunity in Guatemala to buy a national television license. It wasn't a million and a half because there was no equipment involved, only the piece of paper that gave you the right to broadcast across the country. So I sent a, a, a friend of mine, a Guatemalan friend. He went down. They negotiated a price. And I told him, please explain that I don't have the money, but that I do have some leads that could fulfill it in about a month. So he told him that. The guy said, I'm willing to wait for a month. But after that, I just want you to know that the Catholic Church is standing in line to buy it. So we agreed. One month of wait. If the cash didn't come, he would sell it to the Catholic Church. The cash didn't come. And now it was my turn to go to the Lord and said, Lord, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to be watching. 
if you gave me this opportunity, and if I understood you correctly, it means that you have reserved that station for your work, for the third angel's message. As far as I know, it's the only station that is for sale. However, if the Catholic Church gets it, I'm going to reevaluate my understanding of how you work. And so the month went by, and he says, okay, the limit is reached. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm selling it to the Catholic Church. And a, a Guatemalan friend of mine called and said, David, we lost the network. It's going to be sold to the Catholic Church. Tranquilo. Be still, and we'll see what God's going to do. I know, but they're going to buy it. No, 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 no. When God says something is for his use, then he will keep it. And if they do buy it, it means that we have to reevaluate the way we understand how God works. So this is a good experience for us. We have to wait, watch, and wait. They waited for three weeks. Then they called them back and they said, Would you please tell Mr. Gates that the Catholic Church has decided not to buy, and I'm now offering it back to him? And I said, I told you. That was a year ago. I'm still waiting, and he's still waiting. And I will tell you what's going to happen. From my understanding, he will wait until God is ready to pay for it. And he will give it to us. But if we had not have gone forward and seized the opportunity, he would have never known that we were interested, and other doors will close. Wherever you put the sole of your foot, that have I given to you. Let's, do it, let's say it backwards. Wherever you don't put the sole of your feet, I have not given to you. Are you understanding? If you really believe God is asking you to do something, you have to move. Faith without action is worthless. But you say, but I, I, don't, know how, I don't know how to do that. That's not your problem. The only thing you can do is to go forward. It is God's problem to open the doors. If he gives you enough money, when you get there, you can go forward. If he says, wait, you wait. But you have to move. So I have learned one of the secrets is no matter what happens, if God opens a door of opportunity, Christian services from patriarchs and prophets, that God gives opportunity, success depends on how we utilize them. So if you have an opportunity, seize it, because opportunities do not come from the devil. Opportunities to save souls always come from God. And success depends on how you use your opportunities. So, I just came from Ecuador. I've been praying for Ecuador for a long time. And suddenly, oh, I had several Ecuadorian friends. They went to Ecuador, and I said, could you please start there and make some contacts and see if there's a network for sale? I know that God is preparing a way for Ecuador, but I'm not sure. I don't have anybody there. They went and they came back. Well, did you, did you investigate? We didn't have time. Then I tried some other friends. I'm sorry, we can't. Then I had some Ecuadorian friends move from the States back to Ecuador. David, anything you need. So I called them. I'm needing you to do this and this. I'm sorry, we can't. Okay. Lord, I don't know what to do. Suddenly, two Colombians came and said, could we come to Lima, Peru, and see you when you're in Lima? Sure, I'll be in Lima in about a month. Okay, we'll be there. They came and they said, we just moved to Ecuador. What can we do to help? Thank the Lord for the Colombians. I couldn't get the Equatorians to move, but let's get the Colombians. So guess what? They started working. I gave them a whole list of things, and they went click, 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 click. Everything that I asked them to do, they did. They called me this morning, too, to say everything is ready. But my wife and I went through Ecuador, and they had a large number of Ecuadorians all together. Just because Sometimes all you need is a spark. Sometimes all you need is one person to say, this is what we're going to do. And people come and say, I'll go with you. And so we went to Ecuador. And before I got to Ecuador, they said, by the way, we met an Adventist that works in media, and he says there is a network for sale. Would you like to meet with the owners? I'm always wanting to meet with the owners. So I went there. We went to meet with them. And they're a very large television network. And we, they gave us a price. And before we got there, they told me this was the price. When we got there, the price was much higher. Normal standard procedure. Make the price high and negotiate down. I didn't negotiate. I said, that's the price? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. 
And they said, by the way, before you got here, we investigated you. And we know who we're dealing with, and we listened to some of your sermons. And they said, and we think it's a great privilege to do business with you. I said, therefore, you understand that I depend on God to pay for everything. You understand that? Yes, we understand that. And we're going to wait until God gives you the money to do it. You see how the doors open? What if I had not have gone? They would have never heard about me, but once they knew that I was coming, everything fell into place, and they said, we know how you work, we know how you work with God, and we're willing to wait. We're not in a pinch, but we want to do business with you. And I know God's going to keep that there until he's ready to pay for it. And when he's ready to pay for it, it's going to happen fast. Boom, 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 boom. And I have about 20 countries lined up, including Italy. Lined up, ready for national coverage as soon as God releases those funds. Italy, Czech Republic, Peru, per Brazil, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and others. I made my trip there. I made the contacts. The national networks are just sitting there. God decides when he's ready to pay. But may that be an illustration to you. It, wherever you put the sole of your foot, that God will give to you. You sit and wait at home until someday it's convenient for you to go and I get the money and I'm not going to do anything until I get the money. Just, be, just know you're not going to get it. You want money? Start moving. You want the waters to open before you? You want solutions from heaven? Start moving. God will, God will be delighted to do that. But today, he wants you to move by faith because without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's a little... Little story for you today that will hopefully encourage your faith and teach you how to move by faith, and God will reward your faith. Thank you. I thank Emmanuel, Andy, and Tim for that beautiful music that they had today. That was really, really beautiful. I wish I could sing like that. I can't. But uh, I, I do play my trumpet. And before I came, I, my big trumpet is just a little hard to carry with me, so I decided to buy a little pocket trumpet. Professional pocket trumpets are available. They're only this big, and they sound very nice. I bought it and two weeks before, and when I got to, to the office, the U.S. postal system said, delivered to the front desk. Nobody knew where it was. I spent a week trying to find it. I never did find it. I went to the post office and complained. How can you say it was delivered and nobody knows? They said, we have a GPS reading. It was scanned in your parking lot. Okay, you're right. If you scanned it in the parking lot, when you said delivered, you were sitting in the parking lot, that means you delivered it. But nobody knows where it is. We left for Australia without the trumpet. As soon as I get here, they find it. <laughs> one of our other missionaries came and picked up all his boxes. He grabbed the wrong one and took off with it. And he found it after I left. Ah, so I'm, I hear all this beautiful music, and I wish I could stand over there and play my trumpet along. But, c'est la vie. <laughs> I come back again. This time with the trumpet. But if, but if some of you want to, if one of you have a nice trumpet, would like to loan it to me for the next couple of weeks while I'm traveling across the East Coast, please loan me your trumpet. I would love to have one. Today we're going to, we've been, we've come to the last final session for, for today. It's a very interesting session. It's time's up. Time's up. What does time's up mean? Well, we're going to look at, the, at the, the fact that as Seventh-day Adventists, our time is almost up. Our time to prepare is almost finished. Final exam time is almost here. We talked about it already. We're going to study it a little bit more in depth. Shall we bow our heads before we open that subject? Heavenly Father, more than anyone else, you are directing events and ordering the angels to hold the winds 
until the servants of God are sealed. We know that, that the angels will hold the winds until the very, very end, until every single person has decided for the mark of the beast or the seal of the living God. We know that. But they're going to be releasing the winds and releasing the winds. And we know that the, we know that the Bible teaches that the judgment begins in the house of God. We claim to be your remnant people. And if anybody should be interested in these last in these last events, it should be us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate our minds now. We don't understand perfectly. We're looking like in a, 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 a dark mirror. But the word of God shines more and more and like, it, like the dawning of a day. And so we pray that you will illuminate our minds and continue to teach us as we study that we might understand the events as they happen. This generation is to understand more than any other generation. We are, to be, we are to be communicators of your plan to the dying world. So please teach us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus taught in several places that as a master appoints work to a, to a servant and le the Lord leaves on a long trip, that he will appear suddenly and request a rendering of accounts. Just like the, the, the parable of the talents, the master came and required a rendition of accounts. In Matthew 24, the same thing. He says, Blessed is the servant that when his Lord cometh shall find him doing, distributing the meat and doing his responsibilities. In chapter 24, verse 46. But if that evil servant, verse 48, says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunk, and the Lord of the servant shall come in a day that he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him in and sunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For those that are not watching, those that say in their heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and cease to prepare, it will come as a surprise. Never, never does God intend to catch us by surprise. He always informs before something happens. But if we're not watching, and we're not studying, and we're not preparing our hearts, and we're careless and indifferent, we will not be informed about God's movements. Because God doesn't inform the careless and the indifferent. So let's look at the whole idea once again. We do know that the judgment, investigative judgment, is going to be di is divided into two parts. The judgment of the dead and the judgment of the living. The judgment of the dead begin at the beginning of the investigative judgment and has been coming forward. At some point in the future, God will turn his attention on those that are living in this generation. And he will begin with the elders in his house, in the sanctuary. Now, as he begins that process, we claim to be members of the remnant, God's remnant people. We claim to know the truth. And we are without excuse if we're not focusing and studying. And part of the mission and working to be a part of the mission that God gave us. So therefore, we are here today because we want to know what is happening. I myself am learning. You are learning. And the principles that we have learned in some things, we share with each other so that we can learn too. And the light that one has shares with the other. The the light, all new light that we receive is based upon previous truth. It's not a revamping. It's a greater understanding. It's a revealing and unfolding of truths that have been revealed in the past. Therefore, we must understand previous truth if we're going to understand a greater and greater amount of truth. Now, prophecy, we know that prophecy, prophecies that point to prophetic time the last one being the end of the 2300 days, that has been fulfilled. Is that where prophecy finishes? Oh, no. 
There is a lot more to say in the Bible. But it's not so much to forecast a date or to prophesy a date as it is to understand what is happening. God doesn't expect the last generation to be completely blind about events. In fact, they will understand it better than any other generation. That means we've got to study. The same prophecies that were understood in one way will be found to have more information regarding current events. But we have an attitude many times, well, we understand everything. We don't need any more new light. <laughs> exactly. Boing, that's failure. Go back and try again. Start at zero. Go back to, go back, go back to the beginning. Uh, do not collect $200. <laughs> like they used to say, go back to go. Do not collect $200. I forget how that game went. But it's been a long time. It's a monopoly. But God wants to reveal to us everything that is happening just like he wanted to reveal to the apostles the disciples, he wanted to reveal them. He said, there's some things I cannot share with you yet because you are not ready to receive it. That could be our condition today. That God is willing and ready to share more information with us. But we're not ready to receive it because we haven't received the previous yet. So we need to study and understand what we have always believed in order to have further understanding into the future. But for example, let's look at one thing. 25 years ago, I, got, I read a little book somebody gave me about Revelation 17. And I looked at it, and it was talking about the five kings. The most of it, all, the chapter, all the chapter of Revelation 17 is talking about Rome. And I took it to the head of the, the dean of the School of, Tech, uh, of Theology in Montemorelos University. I was working in Mexico. And I said, Doctor, what do you think? He goes, well, we have another understanding about those, about those kings. But on the other hand, this raises a subject that could definitely give us an understanding into the future, but we don't know yet. We'll have to keep watching. And so I kept watching for 25 years. I kept watching and saying, Lord, if this is something that we are to understand, I, I ask you, please, to help me to understand. So I kept reading it, and, well, there was John Paul II kept living and living and living and living and living and living and living. They tried to shoot him, they couldn't kill him, and so he kept on living. <laughs> and there we were, stuck in a... I, I counted all of the... If this interpretation is correct, I said, I don't know how this can work, but there's only eight, and the eight... According to Revelation 17, um, 11, the eight is not yet come, but even he is the eighth, talking about the beast out of the bottomless pit, and, he, and he's one of the seven, and he goeth into perdition. And I go, I don't even understand any of that. You just keep watching, God said. Just keep watching. If there's anything to this, and by the way, you know what? The generation today, they really don't want to know what happened too well, too much, thousands of years ago. The generation today is looking for answers for today. Oh, but we know what happened thousands of years ago. Good. That establishes the Bible as a base of truth. But I still want to know what's going to happen in my lifetime. This generation wants to know answers for the things that are happening today. And you say, well, there was an earthquake in 1755. Good. Good. The stars fell in 1833. Good. What's going to happen in 2015? You understand? They want answers for that. Do you think the Bible has any answers for this generation? Good night. If there was any generation that's going to understand, it has to be this generation. The last generation has more complexities to deal with than any other generation. We can expect a lot of greater understanding. In fact, the wise will understand, but the wicked will not understand. That's what Daniel said. And so, I was watching. And finally, John Paul II dies. Okay. So now, number five is dead, according to that interpretation. I'm sorry, number six. And now it's time for number seven. 
And I saw all the cardinals lining up, and I wonder who's going to be it. Well, I looked at all the possible cardinals and options, and, and I discovered that one of them was called Ratzinger. And I read about him, and he was called, a, he was called the uh, Rottweiler of the Vatican. He was the attack dog. And so I thought he'd make a good candidate considering where we're going in history. And lo and behold, poof, he got elected. Benedict. Okay. So I said, well, now we know who number seven is. If I'm going to be watching. Remember, we have to just keep watching. Today, prophecy is to understand what is happening, not so much to forecast the future. God wants us to understand the current events. So, if this is true, that means that Ratzinger must be there only a short time. And lo and behold, he resigns. Now, which pope resigns? Popes don't resign. They're elected for life. So suddenly this pope resigns. Hey, there's something artificial going on here. There's some other influences and powers here. This will be interesting. But who's number eight? Who's also the beast, and he's one of the seven, but he's also the beast? How is this? I don't understand. And then they elect the current pope. He looks human like everybody else. Hmm? And I go, well, I guess that rules that out. I don't see any beast there. I see a beast power, but I don't see the beast from the bottomless pit there that's going to perdition. And so then I saw an interview. Pastor Steve Wolberg wrote to me and said, David, have you seen my latest interview on 3ABN? No. Look at it. You'll, you'll be very interested because it involves the Pope in Argentina. So I quickly went on and looked, and I discovered that a magazine in Argentina shows the Pope with his face split in two. The previous Pope, and I mean the previous man and the new man. The previous is kind of melancholy. And the new one, kindly old grandfather. All the world loves the new Pope. He's such a grandfather to everybody. And then they quote his sister as saying, Three days after my brother became elected as Pope, he had a spiritual experience. Something happened to him. He is not the same brother I had before. I did not grow up with that man. You go, what? The sister doesn't recognize the person who's her brother? She goes, that's not the person I grew up with. This, this guy is, has a different personality. He has a different character. He's totally different than the brother I grew up with. And then I began to understand who is really running the things. This Pope is possessed. This is not her real brother running things. Her real brother was melancholy, solemn, morose. This guy is a sweetheart all over the world. He knows how to be very humble. He knows how to receive all of it. But when he wants to write something hard, we give one year for Protestants to make things right with Rome. And after that, the sword. How, can, how, how does he speak like double-edged like that? There's a spirit running things that is not him. Satan himself is controlling the last movements with this pope. And what's the next step after this pope? Jesus himself will arrive and appear all over the place. We know it's not the real Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that Rome, about two years ago, the Vatican bought, bought all the rights to broadcast Jesus' second coming? They paid nearly 50 million euros. So when Jesus comes and all the TV networks want to carry it, they got to pay Rome the, for the rights. They're preparing all right for Jesus' second coming. The wrong Jesus, of course. And guess where he's going to go rule? Jerusalem. They're preparing for that too. And so 
All of the events are falling rapidly into place. And all of a sudden, I now understand much better what is happening, whereas before I just had to watch and wait. Now that it's happened, now I understand. Now I can see the fulfillment of prophecy. But I didn't understand last year. I had to wait for it to happen for me to see that it matched. That's how prophecies are in the Bible today. If you're reading, watching, and praying, God will unfold the prophecy as it happens. Not so you can predict the future, so you can understand what is happening in the present. But you have to be watching and praying. The same prophecies that apply to the past also have information for the future. Just like Laodicea applied to literal churches, but it also applied to what? To periods of time. It applies to our generation perfectly. But it was a literal letter written to the city of Laodicea. The same thing. God is a genius. Out of one piece of information, if you read the Bible over and over, you can read exactly the same verse and get a new message from God. Because God keeps unfolding through the interpretation of the Holy Spirit new understandings. But we have to realize that it's not one person God works with. He works with different people around. God doesn't limit his understanding to one single person that understands prophecy. No. He will reveal a little here, a little there, a little there. And as we study and pray together, a general understanding will develop. God works with all his people. And we need to submit our wills to God so that he can use us to understand. And as we study and read, I had a message somebody sent me. I'm always a little scared when I get a message, but this one made sense. David, I have a message from God for you. Oh, that was scary, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm already leery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, what is the message from God? You know what? It made sense. The message said, I have a lot more things to teach you, but you are so busy that you're not spending enough time in prayer. Is that your problem too? I accepted the message and I said, Lord, Forgive me, but I don't know how to fix it. You put me in working in 88 countries. And I could turn everybody off and say, sorry, I'm not available. But it's like a mother who gave birth to 88 babies. You can't give birth to a project and then walk off. When you give birth to a project, you have to help during the process until it's finally up and going, and then you can slowly let go. But you have sent me all over the world preaching and starting projects, and then, I don't understand, I don't know, I don't physically know how to walk away from them and say, I don't have time anymore, I'm going to pray more. I do pray, every day I have my time with God, but I need more. And I said, Lord, just teach me, I'm willing, I just don't know how. So I'm asking the Lord, would you pray for me too? I need the Lord to teach me how to have more free time. When I accept to come to Australia, maybe I should have just stayed and kept on praying. You understand? I'm here to share, but it takes away from my time, quiet time. But that's what happens to me all around the world. Then I go from here, then to New Zealand, and then the, to Fiji, and then Samoa, and Papua New Guinea. I didn't plan all of that. It all came out. Once they found out I was coming to Australia, they all lined up and said, please, 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 and I couldn't say no. So I'm willing to do this, but it's very hard on my quiet time. It's very hard to find time alone when we are so busy. But sometimes our busyness is our own personal affairs, not so much God's work, but it's still the same time. God wants to spend more time with us. So that same message to me is a message to all of us. I have a lot more to share with you, but you need to stop and let me spend some time with me. So that message is a valid message, wouldn't you say? Immediately we recognize the validity of that message. I'm saying, Lord, I want to please and I believe the last three weeks taught me some things. First of all, we learned some of the rules of the game. It's encouraging to learn those rules of the game. It means that anything that you see the enemy doing to reach people, you have the right to do it to, through faith. If you see opportunities that pop up for one side, there are also opportunities for the other side. Like I said, someday China is going to open up, I believe. And when that door, when that door opens, we can be lined up on the outside waiting to get in with everybody else and we can have a rush. Or by faith, you can get an advantage. 
If you know God's going to do it someday, go by faith to China now. Some of you are already working there. We have missionaries in China. We're trying to line up and put as many missionaries in China as we can. Why? Because when that door opens, we don't want to be on the outside coming in. We don't already want to be on the inside. So if you have a conviction that God is going to give you something, start working on it as fast as you can. Don't waste time. When I go to a country, I don't know what God's going to show me. When I scheduled my flight and bought my ticket to Ecuador, there was no TV networks lined up. But I've learned a lesson about God. God doesn't tell you what he's going to do until the last minute. You know why? He doesn't want the enemy to start blocking it before you get there. Get used to the fact that he may not tell you what tomorrow will hold until tomorrow comes. That way, it's all a secret. Nobody knows anything until he says, here it is. Now, once you are aware that there's an opportunity, how can you react? Well, let us think about it. Let us examine the options. And eventually, we will come to a decision. That's called pontificating. If you pontificate, you will lose the opportunity. The other option is, well, we don't have enough money to do that. It's a beautiful opportunity, yes, but we just don't have the resources, human or financial, to do that. So the answer is no. That's another possibility. Or you can say, only God gives opportunities. And if God gives opportunities, success is guaranteed. The answer is yes. And I do that all the time. I go to a place, and I don't even know what God is planning. All I know is that he's going to show me something when he's ready for me to do it. And my job is to seize the opportunity. I want to, I want to read to you from, from a, a book called Gospel Workers. Now, I didn't pull it up. I have another thing I want to read to you here, but I want to read it, pull up Gospel Workers. Because you have to understand, in these rules of the game, you have to understand what you have to do. If you don't know what you have to do, to be honest, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. Is he gospel workers? Here it is. Page 133. It doesn't have the pages here. It just has the chapter names. It, it talks about some of the very important things that we must do if we're going to be, if we're going to actually um, get those opportunities. Let me just open up a chapter and see if it's, if it was, if it's, ah, yeah, okay, backwards a little more. Um, I really, okay, it's not that one. Meditation and breath, thoroughness, okay. Decision and promptness in the work of God. Listen to some of these. There are men who flatter themselves that they might do something great and good if they were only circumstanced differently, while they make no use of the faculties they already have. Hmm? Some people would just say, I could do a great work for God if only I was positioned differently. If I had more money and I had more time, or if I wasn't, I could do something good for God. They will never accomplish anything. Why? They always wait, 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 and they don't make use of what they already have. You want to work for God? Start using what you already have. He should see circumstances as his instruments with which to work. He should master circumstances, but never allow circumstances to master him. Hmm? Seize sur or opportunities, we could say. Seize opportunities. Those are the ones that God gives you. The moment you have it, grab it. It comes from heaven. And it's guaranteed success. The cause of God demands men who, and women who can see quickly and act instantaneously at the right time and with power. If you wait to measure every difficulty and balance every perplexity, you will do but little. Are you a rapid mover or a slow mover? You like to balance everything. You like to check everything. Let's do an analysis and see if it's appropriate for the time. You will do but little. It says, if you will have obstacles and difficulties to encounter at every turn, you must with firm purpose decide to conquer them or they will conquer you. Oh, so you want an easy life? Get out of the war. 
You can't be a soldier for God and say, but I want hot water to take a bath in. Of course we like hot water. But you understand, soldiers very rarely take a hot shower, right? Especially when you're out on the front lines. So if you want to be a worker for God, get used to conquering difficulties and challenges. Because if you allow them to always define your move, they will conquer you. There's, a, there's one here. Here it is. I have been shown that the most signal victories and the most fearful defeats have been decided on a turn of minutes. God requires promptness of action. Delays, doubtings, hesitation, and indecision give the advantage, give the enemy every advantage. I don't know. I, can we decide this now? I'm not sure. That's what Satan needs. He always needs a little bit of hesitation on your part. Napoleon said, in every battle, there's a 10 to 15 minute window. The slightest hesitation on any of the two generals allows the enemy to conquer. When you see that window of opportunity, you grab it. There's one that says here, we must go move at the golden moment. I'm looking for that. I don't have it underlined. Here it says, if anything is to be accomplished to purpose, it must be done at the golden moment. The slightest inclination in the weight should, in the balance should be seen and should determine the matter at once. Long delays tire the angels. Are you understanding some of the rules of the war? God will not tell you what his next step is until you get there. He will say, I need you to go to Macedonia. Come to Macedonia and help us. Okay, so you get your things and you pack your bags like he did Paul and he went to Macedonia. When Paul got to Macedonia, then God revealed the next step. We just talked to this young lady in, um, in California in Los Angeles last week. You know what she said? The Lord impressed me to go to Nepal. I looked it on the internet. I didn't have enough money to go to Nepal. So I decided, Lord, if you intend for me to go to Nepal, I guess you're going to take care of my ticket. She packed her bags and she went to the airport. <laughs> now we know this young lady for a long time. She's a prayer warrior. She must have learned that God opens a way as you go. So she went to the airport and she stood in line. Now imagine that. She stood in line to go on a plane to Nepal. She doesn't have a ticket. As soon as she got there, she pulls her passport out. I'm sorry, miss. You're not, you're not in the passenger list. Oh, it must have been the wrong airline, she said. She didn't know which airline she was going to go on. And so she stood apart and she waited. Lord, if you want me to go to Nepal, you've got to show me how to get there. I don't know. I went to the only airline I knew. Is it another airline you have? And then this guard came up and said, only the people going to China stay in this line. Everybody else needs to leave. And she turned to the lady in front of her and said, where are you going? Well, we're going to Nepal, but we're going to China first and in connecting. Oh, this is the line I'm supposed to be in. When she got there to the desk, you're not on a passenger list. I know, but I'm supposed to go on this flight and I'm supposed to connect to Nepal. Well, let me see. Well, we have a special today. It's very cheap today. She looked at her credit card. Exactly what she had. She bought the ticket. She couldn't have bought it before. It happened right then as she was there. They, everything worked out. And she went to Nepal on that flight. Now, I've never done such a thing. <laughs> it scares me to death to think of packing my bags and going to the airport without having a ticket in my hand. But you understand? God leads us in different ways. There is a little book, there's a little book, and I believe it is called God's Last Invitation to America, something like that. It's written by some Ukrainian, a Ukrainian family, Borovsky, and they tell a story that's, I, I got to share this story with you, but you can, you can find it if you go online, you can find it on the internet, it's available, or if you want to know the address, um, I can put it on later on the, uh, on the screen, but I'll give, it, I'll, I'll give it to you if you want to write it down. It's called uh, www.tinyurl, T-I-N-Y, tinyurl.com, slash mission books. www.tinyurl.com, 
slash mission books. And you'll find it there with several other things and other <clears throat> books. Anyway, Brother Borowski, I don't know what church he belongs to, but I suspect by the language he used that he's probably a Seventh day Adventist. He said a missionary came from North America and started spreading the gospel for a few weeks. A few people accepted the Lord and he went back to North America. Never came back. But they started in their little Ukrainian community, they started sharing the gospel. But then communism came in. It was after the Second World War. Uh, Stalin was elected to be president, became a dictator in Russia, Soviet Union. He was preparing, it took, it took 13 years for him to cement his power before he started killing millions and millions of people and arresting and taking to Siberia Christians, stealing all their children. And so times were getting very hard in the Ukraine, which was under the influence of the control of the Soviet Union. And he said, we were very careful about our Christianity. We couldn't trust knocking on doors anymore. So we got together and prayed and the Lord would say, on 4th Street, house number seven, they're ready. 5th Street, house number 32, go to that house, they're ready. And God would tell them exactly the house number where those people were ready to receive the gospel. And as they got closer and closer to the more the persecution, God began to clean the church a little bit. And, and while they were praying, Brother Smith or whatever his name, I just came up with the name, would say, the Lord has revealed to me that Brother John over there, he stole some money that he never gave back. And Brother John would go, I didn't know anybody knew about that. Brother John, make it right, okay? And then Sister Susie over there would say, the Lord is showing me that, that Martha over there, she did this and she did that. And Martha would go, I didn't know anybody knew that. And all of a sudden, the, the, the members began to realize all their secret sins were being exposed in public. Huh? Would that be a good thing for us to do tonight? Only God can do that, right? But if you knew, you, if you came here, that somebody in here would reveal your secret sin, you know what? You would make things right before you came, right? And that's what the church did. They started making things right and cleaning up their life and taking the skeletons out of the closet and saying, I'm sorry, I, I've done this. Please forgive me. I want to make it right. And the church started entering a phase of very of purification. And then God went into a final stage. Now that he had total control of them, he started telling the 60 families that were there, I want you to leave, one at a time. Poof, 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 they started disappearing. And nobody knew where they were going. It just said, God led them, and they said, God is leading us to do this. Bye-bye. They prayed together, and they were disappeared. One day, it was Borowski's turn. The wife set the table for supper, and then the Holy Spirit said, do not eat supper. Leave the table completely set. Take the cow, hook it up to the carriage, put some food and clothing, and walk out of town. But Lord, why take a cow? We could go better with a horse. No, take the cow. You see how detailed God is? God cared enough to tell them exactly what kind of animal to take. So they piled everything on. They took a cow. Now, the secret police had told everybody, report any movements. If you see anybody leaving town or coming in, you report it to the secret police. Well, all the neighbors heard some commotion, looked outside. Oh, it's only some gypsies in there. They only have a cow. They're not going anywhere. Nobody goes anywhere with a cow. So they walked, and they walked, and they walked. As they were walking, secret police came by on their cars. And they went right to the farm. And they waited and said, oh, the table is set. They're going to come back tonight. I'm sure they'll come back to eat supper. Look at that. They just stepped outside. They'll be right back. The police waited all night. Nobody came back. And then they knew something had happened. They were angry. So they went down the road looking and talked to the neighbors. Did you see anybody leave last night? No, we just saw some gypsies walking out of town with their cow. That was them. And they ran down the road and God said, okay, just as sun up. It's time for you to leave the road. Turn right and go in here. And they turned in and went in there. And as they were going in, the police went by. Well, guess what? About 10 o'clock, they started getting hungry. Lord, what do we eat? 
Stop, get some of the grain you put on there, milk the cow. <laughs> the cow was converting grass to milk and they had milk for the family all the way through their trip. What if they'd taken a horse? Huh? That would have been interesting. <laughs> They were thirsty. We need water, Lord. We, you didn't tell us to bring water. Stop. Ten steps to the right, five steps to the left. Dig there. Water came out of the ground. What impressed me was the details. God gave them every single detail during the whole trip. And when they finished their trip, they came to an opening near the border of China. All 60 families were already there. Through different ways, God led all 60 families. You know what God wants to do with us? He wants to micromanage all our movements. He wants to tell us, turn left. And doesn't that what Isaiah 30 verse 21 says? And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the left and turn to the right. Or Psalms, Psalms 32, 8, which says, I will lead, guide you with my eyes. What a, what a, I have it right here, but, but I have it in, in, in German. And, and, uh, I like it in German. Ich will dich unterweisen und dir den Weg zeigen, den du gehen sollst. Ich will dich mit meinen Augen leiten. I will with my eyes guide you. Sehr gut, danke schön. God will guide you with his eyes, but you have to be watching his face. If you're not watching when he goes... You see, if you're watching, keep your eyes on Jesus... He will guide you with, all he has to do is. Yeah? But if you have those things in your ears, boom, 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 forget it. You just watched a movie. Da, 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 da. Wow! It'll be two or three days before you can even hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead and put all the noise of the world in your brain. You definitely cannot hear God's whisper. You want to hear that still small voice? Tune out the world. And so the Borowskis found out that God led them there. But some of the families said, you know, it's a pain to sleep outside. We liked our big barns, our farms, and our farmhouses, and all the food we had, and the animals we had. It was so much more comfortable. We're going back home. And the Holy Spirit said, don't go. If you go back home, you will be deported to, to um Siberia and your children will be taken from you and raised as communists. In spite of that warning from the Holy Spirit, 30 families went back. All of them disappeared. And their children were taken from them and raised as communists. Those who stayed eventually went through difficult times, made it into China, immigrated to Australia, and eventually ended up in Canada. You need to read that story. It will give you confidence that God knows exactly how to mic micromanage you. It gives me great confidence. When we've got to turn left or when we have to turn right, God will tell us. He knows what's coming in the future and he will prepare us ahead of time. But that's where we have to be ready, ready, ready. Ready or not, here I come. The time is coming. There is a time when Jesus says the time is up. And for Seventh-day Adventists, we're at the time. We're, we're at closing time. The events that happened in September tell us that something very, very important is happening on earth. The next stage of the great... Con Some people say, well, he went there and nothing happened. Oh, really? You don't know what happened in private? The Pope was very, very clear what his intentions were. Remember, the devil can't do anything without first revealing it. And God will not do anything without first revealing it. So before he went, there's an encyclical published all about what he intends to do. The Sunday Law. Of course, it was packaged in environmental issues and family issues. There's only one, one thing, and that is the Sunday Law. We don't know what happened behind closed doors. We don't know what decisions. Apparently, nothing happened. Wrong. Very major decisions were made and directions taken. And one of these days, we're going to find out what they are. And if you're not watching, it will cut you by surprise. But we don't have to be surprised. We already know what is happening. The, the great controversy has now moved to the next level.
And in heaven, God is moving to the next level as well, and that is the judgment of the living. And the judgment of God begins in God's house. God's word tells us. And so therefore, we must be ready and awake and watching. We cannot be sleeping right now. Time is up. What happens? What happens when our name goes before? Will we know? That was a good question we were talking about a little bit ago. No, we won't know. Many whose name will be found one thing will still be coming to church, will still be paying, returning their tithe and offering, still leading and singing in the choir, not knowing that the door has closed for eternity. Those of us that are covered by the robe of righteousness, we still have some maturing to do. God will carry us through when finally he cleans house. By the way, I need to read you this, and then I'll be closing soon. I need to read you this because you may not have read it before. It's not written by Ellen G. White, but it's a testimony of a communication from Sister White. Sister White used to live in Loma Linda. And when she was older, she would take walks in the morning, like some of us need to walk, right? I like to run. And I've been so busy, I haven't run in two months, and I'm feeling like, Ugh, my body is complaining to me. You better start running before you can't run. But she was walking every morning, and she had with her her granddaughter's husband, Elder Robinson, had another lady, a sister called McIntyre, and with her also was another um, friend called Will Ross. The three of the four of them were walking along toward the Loma Linda train station, and Brother Ross asked Ellen G. White, Sister White, could you tell me what exactly is it going to be at the very, very end of time? How, how is God going to prepare the church? Well, Sister White said, this was about 1908, and Sister White, in quotes, this is what his testimony is. I have a signed copy. This is just text here, but I have a signed copy. If you go into Google and just type Ellen White, Loma Linda train station, you will find it. Sister White told us, as we three stood there on a platform, that there was a terrible storm of persecution coming like a windstorm that blew down every standing object. There was not a Seventh-day Adventist to be seen. They, like the disciples, forsook Christ and fled. And all who had sought positions were never seen anymore again. In other words, if you were trying to climb the ladder of the church, you disappeared forever. After the storm, there was a calm. Then the Adventists arose like a great flock of sheep, but there were no shepherds. Ooh, that, that strikes me right here, huh? After, after the storm, when it blew down everything, Adventists started popping up afterward. There were no shepherds. What happened to all the shepherds? If you're a shepherd, you better make sure that you're, you're humble and working with God. Because when that storm hits, most shepherds are washed away. She said there were no shepherds. They all waited in earnest prayer for help, and wisdom, and the Lord answered them, helping them to choose leaders from among themselves who had never sought positions before. They prayed earnestly for the Holy Spirit, which was poured down upon them, making them fully ready for service. And they went forth fair as a moon, clear as a sun, and terrible as an army with banners to give the message to the world. This is the description of the latter rain. I was astonished, he said, and I asked if that applied to Loma Linda, as we were looking in that direction. And Ellen G. White and Sister White replied to my question by stating it applied to the entire denominational world. I was so stunned, I did not ask any more questions. This testimony was written down when Elder Robinson in 1943, 43 years later. Some of you might still remember 1943. I don't know. I'm not that old yet. I was born in the 50s. But some of you, anybody here born in the 40s? There's a few. Okay. Nobody born in the 30s? Yes? Look at that. Wow. Amazing. Look. They had met in church, and the man who wrote this down 
talked to Elder Robinson with Elder Ross, and he remembered clearly the conversation, and they decided to write it down and sign it. So they wrote it down, seeing that they all remembered the same thing, and decided to put it down. And I have a copy of the signed, I have a copy of the signed statement with their signatures on it. And he wrote it down right there in January 16 of 1946, not wishing that this would be forgotten. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us the following. It tells us that a storm is coming. There's a thousand hidden batteries. Remember we read, in, we read earlier today? Satan has a thousand hidden batteries aimed at God's people. I believe that the very clearly anti-terrorism laws were made specifically to use against God's people. They're kind of like blanket. All you have to be is suspected. You have no rights. The laws allow for any suspected terrorist to be dealt with right away. No process of law required for suspects. Every country could be different, I don't know, but I suspect that terrorist laws in most countries are about the same. Nobody likes terrorists. But who are terrorists? Well, according to Rome, anybody who speaks against Rome is a terrorist. And Rome is helping to make these laws. So what is required for Adventists to be charged with terrorism? I learned a lot when I was living in South America, in a country. I won't state the country so it doesn't cause any political ramification. But in this country I was living in, there was political convulsions. The president was voted in. They threw him out. He was put back in, right from prison. They took him from prison and put him back in. And then there was opposition, and the opposition was doing a peace march, just to, just to be marching to say, we oppose. As they were marching down, some shots were fired from among the inside of this peaceful march, and immediately the military started firing in the soldiers, and there was a lot of dead people inside there. But the opposition said, we never had arms. Later it was discovered that the government planted people on the inside to fire the shots. And then the opposition was blamed. Did you know the Adventist church is riddled with enemies? The Adventist church is filled with enemies of truth. They're called a the synagogue of Satan. They say they are Jews, but they are not. They do lie. All it takes is one enemy to do something that would be considered that way, and a whole entire church will be labeled to be terrorist. It's not a real Adventist doing it. It's an enemy doing it. That's always a tactic. Hitler burned down his own Reichstag, and then he blamed the enemies. And we know how to knock down twin trade towers as well. All you do is attack yourself and blame the enemy. It's an age-old trick. When God says, my people are ready, it is time to clean house, something will happen that will bring a worldwide attack against God's people. All of us are going to go into hiding. According to that. You know why? Because they're not going to accuse us of keeping the Sabbath. They're going to accuse us of something falsely. I'm not going to stand up and say, I'm a terrorist. No, I'm not going to do that because I'm not. And neither are you. But when they accuse you falsely, the tendency is to... But after the calm, after the initial wind, whoever's left, whoever's still faithful, will start popping up. And it will be time to say, where are the rest of them? Where are the other nine? They never came back. Those who were shallow, those who didn't have a solid relationship, those who never believed anyway, they're going to say, I'm out of here. I don't want to be part of that group. Whoever's left has to get together. Uh, Pastor Mark Finley was asked one time at a meeting, what will a general conference do? What will be their position when we have to deal with the Sunday law? And you know what his response was? What general conference? 
You see, we don't understand what's going to happen. I don't think he was trying to be a prophet, but that was very prophetic. Once this attack ha happens, properties, buildings, bank accounts, everything will be seized. There will not be any legal structure in which to operate. And so here's where your church membership must be written in heaven. Very important that God understands what side you're on. If you have the white robe of righteousness, you will be hidden during that time. And then you'll come back and say, well, where are the rest? I don't know. And you'll get together and pray together. And as you pray, God will lead you to reorganize and lead us together to reorganize. And then we will say, Lord, we're such a little group. We cannot possibly succeed. And God said, you're right, you can't. We need the Holy Spirit. You're right, I'll give it to you. And when the, whole, when the small group of people, the majority of which are totally consecrated to God, the Holy Spirit will be easily poured out. And they will go forth like a mighty army with banners, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and they will finish the loud cry. And it will go everywhere, unstoppable. And just like Habakkuk 2, verse 14 says, and the glory of the Lord will fill the entire earth as waters cover the sea. I'm looking forward to that day. But the time is now. The time is running out. We are here today because we are interested in being ready for Jesus' coming. The events we just witnessed only last month tell us that we are at the end of time. That God has given permission for the enemy to move forward to the next stage. And that means God himself is moving also to the next stage. Very important for us to understand. Whenever things move forward, both sides move forward. Whenever the doors open, they open up for both sides. Everything happens fairly and equally. And God makes the rules, and they both abide by those rules. Today, we have finished, had a wonderful day together. And last night. I am grateful for the opportunity to have come. And I would like to say that I'm grateful to Steps to Life for coordinating on a regular basis speakers from around the world that bring such su subjects to our attention. Because it doesn't normally happen. All around the world we have the same older problem. We have some divisions more conservative than others, but there's a general tendency to be politically correct. And right now these subjects, I'm sorry, they're not politically correct. The message for the loud cry is not politically correct. It's not an accident that we have a front runner in the United States running for president that believes the Advent message. It's not an accident. At the very moment when events are happening to close the doors of freedom, God puts the Advent message right on the front page. He's such a genius. It's ironic, it's almost funny that at the very moment an enemy wants to close the doors subtly, God said, no, 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 no. Nothing is done subtly. Everything will go on the front page. When you want to deal with something like that, you got to ask the front runner what he thinks about it. Is he perfect? Dr. Ben Carson is not perfect. Does he make all the right decisions? He doesn't. Neither do I, neither do you. You got to pray for him. It's a big, heavy responsibility to be in the eyesight of an entire world. It's a big responsibility to represent truth to the world. And that's what God is going to do. We are told that Adventists may be a small, unnoticed group, but this will not remain that way forever. They're going to come to the forefront. It's already happening. Amen. Who would have dreamed four or five years ago that the front runner would be a Seventh-day Adventist physician? It's because God wants to bring truth out. Pray, 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 pray for that man. Pray for your families. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your country. We want the angels to hold the winds of strife until we can take the gospel to as many places as we can. Your resources, put them to work for God. Ask him, he will tell you how to do it, but just put them in, put them in, put them in. If you have any way to grab resources, grab them and do that. God will show you how to do that. He will impress you. And when the time comes where all you have is a cord in your hand, you're in the best hands possible. God will show us. I want to just mention also that at the very, very, very back at the end. Sabbath is finishing now. This book I mentioned last night, Heralding the Loud Cry, 
I'm still finishing it. But I ask him, please, to order some books. This book is a very nice book, nicely bound. But it's written by an Australian friend of mine that's in Bolivia right now. It's about the 1888 message and how it's been developing until today and the message that we need to have. And it has been so encouraging. I've been sharing some of the principles with you. It will change your life. Right now, he's recording in English all those sermons down in Bolivia, and I'm going to release them on Internet. You can find them very soon. I'm going to translate them into all kinds of languages. But this book is available. I hope, I don't know how many we have, but I hope that, that if you are able, that you will be able to do that. I am told that there's also other materials. Two years ago, prepare now for the final battle. And the two books, Mission Pilot, The Hijacking, and The Mission Miracles, the story of the television network and how the details of how to move forward by faith. I hope these books, if you don't have them, will be a blessing to you. There's some available tonight. But Steps to Life takes a big risk financially every time they pay that expense to bring somebody here. Thank you for the offerings and supporting them. Thank you for the products that you buy from them. It helps to continue going month by month. Someday I'm looking forward to that. Won't, someday soon that won't be necessary. Someday I'm looking forward as steps to life and all other ministries. Many of you are in ministry as well. In my ministry and other ministries and everybody. God himself will micromanage each ministry into an explosion of truth across the world. And God himself is going to pay for it. Today there's a lot of human work to make it possible. God still blesses. But someday in the future I'm expecting God to break through human limitations and explode every ministry into a worldwide work. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm dreaming of. And I know it will happen. God has promised me that will happen. I want to thank you for the fun time, beautiful time we've had together. May the Holy Spirit bless each of you. And as we close for Sabbath, I don't know if do you want me to have just a closing prayer. Is that okay? Okay, I'm going to have a, let's get on our knees and we'll have a closing prayer. And at the same time, we'll, We'll say thank you for the Sabbath hours. What a beautiful Sabbath we have had, Lord. It has been a blessed Sabbath. The seventh day you set aside for us, and it has been filled with learning, with the Holy Spirit touching our hearts and minds. And Lord, we thank you for these special Sabbath hours. May we, may we learn more and more from you how to properly honor you on that day. We know so little. The little that we've been accustomed to we think is enough. No, there's much more to learn yet about the Sabbath. We thank you also for the messages. We thank you for the testimonies. We thank you for the, the time to, uh, conversations we have had today and others have had together. For the beautiful music that you brought to us. And for these messages that have touched our heart. Lord, we want the Holy Spirit to prepare us for that great day. We want the Holy Spirit to take total control and possess us. The time is up. And it is time to be totally controlled by you. The door is still open. And we go through that door and we say, Thank you, Lord, for holding that opportunity open. May we use our time, our influences, our education, our resources, everything we have, everything we are, to move forward the mission of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, that's what we're asking for. Multiply the resources we have. Multiply the time so that we can pray more together. Help us not to become bitter when, when we are hurt. Help us not to become bitter when people misunderstand or even if, if they say things on purpose that we're hurt. Help us to remain humble. Help us, help us to remain, remain loving. Place your love in our hearts so that we can love even those that mistreat us. And most of all, help us not to mistreat anybody. Help us to be filled with love so that we treat others the same way we want to be treated. Bless our leaders. Bless our pastors. Bless this dear church that you love so much like the apple of your eye. We are part of that church and we place ourselves in your hands. We don't want to just be a church. We want to be a movement once again. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Bless us and anoint us Prepare us and someday seal us, we pray. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.